So I'm going to talk about jail, and um, I'm just going to do a little bit of a recap about the place that she finds herself in, where we find her. So I kind of dug into some concordances and things like that, and um, uh, yeah, preacher's license. Okay, so her name, her name jail, which is J-A-E-L. Many years ago, we actually had a family in church, and they actually called their little girl jail, and I was like, what in the world were they thinking? I mean... What legacy does this, you know, I remember just thinking, surely you've spelt her wrong, and they were there and saying, well, you pronounce it J-L, but it is just jail. Anyway, so her name is Jail. Interesting. Her name means a mountain goat, so actually it gives you an indication of the type of people they were. They were part of a nomadic tribe, and so the Bedouins, you know, they, they live in these tents and they move around. In our country, we might call them travelers. You know, they, every, most countries have these type of people that move from place to place. And so they were a group of travelers, and they moved around. And so maybe that's why our parents thought, oh, she'll be a mountain goat. She'll be running up and down the hills wherever she is. Um, we find her in the Bible. She is married to a man called Hebner. And Hebner is a businessman. He is a, he is a nomad as well. And Jael and Hebner were tinsmiths. So that was their occupation. They made farming tools, they made domestic items, and they made weapons. And so they actually are interesting because Hebner is actually a distant relative of Moses' father-in-law. And so he's come down from Moses' line. He can count Moses as one of his relatives. And so they are they are moving around from place to place. But they have decided not to just align themselves with the Israelites or the Canaanites. Because of their business, they want to actually be all things to all people. They're, they're staying on friendly terms with everybody. So they're staying on friendly terms and they're, um, you know, because they're, they have got some goods to sell, they'll sell the weapons to the Canaanites, they'll sell the tent pegs and whatever. So that's what they do. And so they live, apparently he, they lived in what was called a city of refuge. These little cities that were set up. Um, Moses had set these cities up and said, you know, there's a place to go to if you want to live in peace. So actually they were quite peace-loving people because they stayed on good terms with anyone that they lived with. And so that's where we find them. And um, and they are living in Israel at this time. Now, Israel <clears throat> Israel has been living in oppression. So, Kat spoke about it last week. You know, um, Joshua comes into the land. Joshua conquers the land. Everything is wonderful. Everything is going great. You know, everything is going wonderful. And then Joshua dies. And there's that very sad verse. And then there arose a people that forgot all about God, forgot all about Egypt, forgot about Joshua and they went their own ways. And then when they get overtaken and they get conquered by all the different tribes in those areas and the different peoples of those areas, they cry out and they're like, oh God, help us, help us. And then he sends someone and then everything is good and then it happens again and again. And so <clears throat> this is where we find Jael. Jael is living in the southern part of Israel. They're living here, her and her husband, and Israel Israel has someone, a woman called Deborah. She is the judge, and Deborah is the judge, and she is, she is prophesying, she's praying, and God really uses this woman. And one day, the people have been living in, in devastation for about 20 years. And so um, they, they've been living for about 20 years in persecution, and they said, okay, this is what's going to happen. Um, Deborah says, I believe God has said, we need to go and conquer them. So she says to Barak, the man in charge, hey, Barak, God has given me a word that we need to go and conquer. And he's like, okay, I'm not going unless you come with me, you know. It's one thing to give the prophecy, but if, if you come with me, then maybe it'll happen. You know, you know that fear that kind of builds up with this, with us, and Kath so eloquently spoke about it last week. And then Deborah has another word. She says, okay. I will, God will give it to you, but God is not going to give you the glory. The glory is going to go to a woman. And you can imagine Barak thinking, okay, I understand that. You'll get the glory because you are a woman and that's fine. But who knows what God's plans are? And this is where we find ourselves. So 
um, <clears throat> the judges that God sent, it was interesting, he sent many different judges. Before Deborah, there were three judges. One of them was a guy called Othniel, and he was Caleb's nephew. I thought that was interesting. The baton was held, handed on strongly there. So they had all these different ones that God, that, um, that God gave. And then, you know, it says, he came, they had the Spirit of God on him. The land was quiet for 40 years. He died. And the people went back again. And then God raises someone else up and helps them. And this went back and forth like a ping pong. And now we find ourselves with Deborah in charge. And Deborah's given the charge, you need to go and conquer the Canaanites. They have, they have lorded it over you for 20 years, and you need to go and conquer them. And gives this prophetic word. Interesting, the price of disobedience. You know, when you see the Israelites, they are living in fear. They are living in... They're worshiping other gods. They're, they have lost their way. That verse that Kath spoke last week, they have lost their way. They've, they've lost the road that the parents walked on is a really sad indictment. You know, I hope that's never, I hope in 80 years time, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren aren't walking on a different road. And the way they won't be is that we hand the baton on well and we are strong and we keep meeting and we keep talking, we keep sharing and we keep speaking about Jesus. You know, the, that verse really struck me. Judges 2.10, then another generation grew up that didn't know anything of God or the work that he had done for Israel. I wanted to just pause before I get into jail. And that verse really struck me about Aberdeen. And I began to think about Aberdeen, and I began to read up about the revival that happened in Aberdeen 160, 70 years ago. There was a man came up from Liverpool, and a man came up in the 1850s and came up here and felt God calling him up to Aberdeen to speak and to preach. And he began to hold these children's meetings, and the children started coming, and he was sharing about, about Jesus, and they were singing songs, they were learning all about Jesus, and then the kids went and got their parents. And you know, they said that the services were bursting at the seam. A revival broke out in the 1850s in Aberdeen that was phenomenal. And that's when the great church building program began. And they were meeting at, they were meeting at a church, um, you know, the church near St. Saint, uh, Saint Marshall's, I think it's Grey Friars Church. And then they spilled over, they started meeting in another church, and they began, they began building all sorts of churches. And if you start looking at the great church building program in Aberdeen, in our city, it began because a man felt God called him to come and speak to the children of this city. Because when you get the children, those children are strong, and those children go on and lead their children. If you just speak to the older generation, they might die off. You need to get the children and the youth. That's why we must never, never give up praying and supporting our children's work, our crash work, and our youth work, and just pray over them. So I began to think, you know, Aberdeen was a hub. Everybody, there was people growing up in Aberdeen that were sent out as missionaries. It was amazing. Our old church building was, was built in 2000, just over 2005, 2000, uh, 1905, 1906, because it was an offshoot from the church, St. Andrews, which is just beside um, the art center. The art center used to be a big church building. I began to look at all the church buildings in Aberdeen. And I, I didn't look at the ancient ones like St. Macker's Cathedral, but I started looking at the ones that were built 200 years ago, 160, 70 years ago from this revival. And I came to 86 churches that were built, beautiful glorious buildings with spires because that generation followed Jesus. And because of compromise, because they stopped reading the word, because we stopped we started substituting Christ church activities for other things, because we began to open on a Sunday, because we had a lure for pleasure, because we lowered our standards, because of the love of money. The sad indictment is, of those 86 churches, 27 are still churches, 12, and then 12 more are earmarked for closure. 11 churches were to have been turned into flats, 10 have been turned into nightclubs, casinos, and entertainment places. One is actually a motorbike showroom. Two have become just sole, solely as bars. Three have been are, in, are derelict and are 
the, the pigeons live in them now. Three were demolished to make, to make way for the road system in Aberdeen over the years. Six of them have become offices. Six of them are derelict and unused. One was bought over by the university and four have been bought over to be used as charities. Those buildings were people's money, their tithe money. They sacrificed to build those buildings. And when I started reading about them, how they saved money to build the first thousand seater building, we're talking about Aberdeen when the population was nothing like it is now. And they, were had, they had a vision for a thousand people. In fact, the church that Hebron is in at the moment, um, it's, it's um, I'm just trying to think where it is. It's, it's, near, it's near Gilcomston Park. But the Hebron church there, they used to have, they could seat up to a thousand people and they had three services on a Sunday to pack the people in. They were doing multiple services 150, 60 years ago. You know, it's not nothing new, but because of compromise. And you know, I began to write down some of the names of these churches. Can you imagine the glorious names they had? And now it's called Soul Bar, Pearl Lounge, Ministry of Sin, The College. Actually, it's a, it's a take on, that's where they used to train ministers, and now the bar is called The College. The Spiritualist. Slane's Castle is all to do with, you know, Dracula. It's a Gothic temple. That was a beautiful built, building built for the glory of God. One's called the Exodus, one's called the Cross. And you know something, it is sad, but I'm so glad that Jesus doesn't just live in buildings. He lives in the living stones. And I was thinking about this building. We are here going, woohoo, look at this building. How sad in two generations if this was derelict and people spoke about what used to happen. You know, and we have to be so vigilant, so determined in the season that God has given us. We are not going to let the flame burn out. Okay? And so this is where we find Israel. I just thought that was an interesting aside about Aberdeen. <clears throat> so here we find Jail. Jail is an ordinary girl, and I see four simple, simple lessons, so simple because they're in just three or four verses, that I think we can apply to our lives today. And the first thing I wanted to speak about was Jail's opportunity. So to give you a recap in the story, um, you know, Israel along with Deborah and Barak, go and have this big fight. They come, and of course, Sisera comes with 900 chariots and all the things, and they feel intimidated, but God gives them the glory. And so they, their chariots get stuck in the mud. They have all sorts of problems, and Israel starts winning. And the commander, which is Sisera, he gets off his chariot, and he just escapes on foot. He's thinking, I'd, I'd be fed, better running. So he runs away. And this is where he runs. So meanwhile, Sisera is running for his life. He's running away thinking, well, all my army is dead. All the chariots have gone. Israel has taken over there. God has done it again. I need to save my own skin. He is running for his life. And he heads for his friend. Remember I said that they were friends with everybody. And his friend actually is Hebner. Hebner is very friendly with um, Sisera's commander. Jabin. So he, it says in the Bible, meanwhile, Sisera, running for his life, is headed for the tent of Jael, wife of Hebner, the Kenite. And they were on good terms with each other. Jael stepped out to meet him. Come in, sir. Stay here. Don't be afraid. It's almost like a spider in his web saying to the fly, come on in for a cup of tea. Come into my web. You know, interesting, isn't it? Anyways, that's my simple idea. So she and she invites him in. So she went in, so he went into her tent. Again, very controversial. She covers him with a blanket. He said, Please, can you give me a little bit of water? I'm thirsty. She opened a bottle of milk and gave him a drink. Then she covered him up again and he goes to sleep. And before he sleeps, he said, Hey, stand at the front of your tent. And if anyone comes by and asks you, Is there anyone here? Tell him, No, not a soul. So he asks her to lie. So that's the little bit in the Bible. <laughs> it's all of four verses. So here we go. Jail has an opportunity. She knew what was happening. She knew what was going on. I believe Jail was a bit like Rahab. 
uh, because they're nomads, they know all the stories. They're friendly with everyone. But I believe Jael has a fear of God within her. And she has no idea that God's going to use her. And here she is in this vulnerable position. Her husband is nowhere to be seen. I don't know where he is. Maybe he's gone somewhere else. But she is by herself. And she's heard the story. She's now heard that she's obviously heard from him that the Israelites have taken over. And she's thinking to herself, okay, I'm like Rahab. I've heard the stories. And I want to open up to see what's going on. And she's very up to date with current affairs. She allows him into her tent. And this is really unusual. You don't do something like that unless you are a prostitute. You would not do that, especially if you're in a happy marriage. You would not invite a man into your tent. But she takes this opportunity. I remember many years ago speaking to a man in Aberdeen, and he said he really felt the Lord. Now, this is just unusual, but he really had a strong feeling. He used to drive up and down and see these girls standing, you know, the prostitutes in Aberdeen standing, and he just... Uh, one day his heart broke and he, and he went up to one of the girls and he said, how much do you charge? And she said, and he goes, I just want to buy your time. And he took her in the car and he shared the gospel with her and then he gave her some money. And he did that a few times. It is so controversial and I'm not suggesting we do things like that. But you know, God sometimes prompts us to do controversial things and unusual things. And that girl was radically radically heard about the gospel because this man was prompted to do something that the Holy Spirit had led, led him to. She took the offer to offer safety. She could have let him run on by, but she brings him into her tent. So she has the opportunity to let him go or to bring him in, and she chooses to bring him in. She, she is, you know, she's looking at this opportunity. She offers him hospitality, which is again, an incredible thing that, that they did in those days. That comes natural to her to offer hospitality, but to offer hospitality to a man on his own, maybe not so sure. She offers him to just not have food, have rest. She offers him to have a drink. She offers him to rest and relax. And then she stands at the door like he tells her to, and, she's, and he sleeps. And this is when I think she's prompted by the Holy Spirit. She looks back and she thinks, you know what? Part of her job as a nomad, the women in those days, they put up and they put down the tents. They knew all about putting up tent pegs. They knew all about erecting the tents, doing, they did the heavy work, you know. They were used to doing things like that. So she's looking at him. And I just think, you know, sometimes opportunity comes our way. And sometimes we look at the opportunity and think, oh, if only... If only my husband just sw swung in by, he could do it. Or if only, you know, it was her tent that he came to. She didn't have any weapons in her tent. She didn't have any sword. She didn't have anything. She had tent pegs. And she sees the opportunity. She didn't think, oh, what if, what if. And I just sometimes think, my personal reflection on this is, when the Holy Spirit prompts us, don't hesitate and act and step out of your comfort zone. I loved when Leanne shared a couple of we a few weeks ago and she said, you know, I had this kind of word and I just shared it and it sounded so silly. And yet the person said, oh, that means so much to me. You know, sometimes what God asks us to do sounds silly and we can talk ourselves out of the situation. This wasn't silly. This was evil and wicked what she was about to do. But she allowed herself to be in that position. Opportunity comes, and sometimes opportunity goes, and it never comes again. Sometimes it's just a moment, and if we don't act, it's gone, you know? I remember when J. John was up here, we went out for dinner, and we were chatting to him and having a conversation, and he we were talking about prompting of the Holy Spirit, and he said, you know, I have been prompted to speak to people and famous people, and he said, he shared this, and he said, you know, I remember feeling really burdened <coughs> feeling really burdened for Amy Winehouse and I wanted to send her a text and I felt burdened and burdened and I did nothing about it and within two or three days she died I, I, read, I read about her in the newspaper and he says from that moment onwards I thought God whenever you prompt me I will contact and he has contacted I think, you know, Billy Connolly all sorts of people, celebrities and people like that if the Lord prompts him, act on it Okay? Act on it. 
And so that's what I wanted to say. The second thing is, she used the tools she had been given. She looked around her tent. There was no other weapons in her tent. There might have been in her husband's tent, because quite often they had two or three different tents. But there was no other weapons in her tent apart from tent pegs and a big hammer. In her circumstances, she was, like I said, she was very skillful at doing this. She waited, and then he was sound asleep. You can imagine him snoring quietly and thinking, oh, Lord, I don't know if I can do this. And then another snore. Wow. You can just imagine. I would be like, okay, Lord, if he snores five times and a grunt, then I'll know it's the Holy Spirit. I don't know how many fleeces she laid. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it was impulsive. I don't know what she did. But she knew that the hand of the enemy was in her hand. This was an opportunity. He might waken up. He might rape her. She didn't know what was going to happen. Her husband might come back, and maybe he would do it, but she felt prompted, and what she did is she quietly goes up to him. She gets her tent peg, and she hammers a nail into his, in, through his temple, and she kills him in one blow. So I read some commentator, if it wasn't the tent peg that killed him, it would have been the hammer on his skull. And I thought, I can't even watch. You know when they take blood from me, I have to turn away. I was somewhere and they, and they, were, they were giving me an injection. Honestly, I went for my booster and they were giving me an injection. And I turned away and they said, oh, are you okay? And I said, sorry, I can't even see a needle going in. I'm really bad. So how you can pick up a tent peg and kill someone, I don't know. I wonder how their relationship with her husband was after that. I bet he was a really nice guy. <laughs> he, didn't, he wasn't going to mess with his wife anymore, was he? <clears throat> she used the tools that she had been given. You know, God equips us for the work that he has designed for us. He has designed unique work for all of us. And can I say something, girls? You know, he tells us he gives us a yoke. And he, you know, that's like a harness, a yoke. If the yoke is not fitting you, maybe you're trying to wear someone else's yoke, okay? If the yoke is too hard, if the yoke doesn't fit well, if you're trying too hard to do things, maybe you're doing the wrong job. Because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. That's what it says in the scripture. So it should be easy to wear and it should be easy to do what God has given you because he has given you the equipment. He has given you the tools to do what he wants you to do. Remember, I've said this many times, God doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called, okay? Whatever he has called you into, he will equip you. And it takes courage to offer up your tools. Think about it. Little Naaman servant girl, which we'll speak about later, she was a little slave girl and her little tool was her voice. Have you heard about this, this guy called Elisha or is Elijah? I can't remember, you know? Have you heard about him? What about the little boy with his packed lunch? How insignificant was that? But he opened up his little, his little lunchbox. What about David? You know, David opened up his slingshot. They tried to give him a, a, a sword. They tried to give him the proper weapons. But he used what he had. You know, Jael didn't wait till her husband came home with a sword. She didn't run to his tent to get a sword. She used what she had. And God has given us enough. And it says in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 5, and I'm reading from the Amplified Version, such is the confidence and steadfast reliance and absolute trust that we have through Christ towards God that now that we are sufficiently qualified in ourselves to claim anything for, as coming from him, but our sufficiency and qualifications come from God. Oh, so not that we are sufficiently qualified. Sorry, I read that wrong. Not that we are sufficiently qualified in ourselves to claim anything, but our sufficiency, our competency comes from God, okay? And the third thing I wanted to speak about is, here's my controversial bit, sometimes it's more important, some things are more important than following rules. Okay? I know it's controversial. Some things are more important than following rules. And when Sisera is murdered, he, it was a major act of treachery. I mean, that is really awful, you know. But she just went against the thing. You know, you weren't supposed to murder in cold blood. She had, she had said one thing and done another thing. So what she has done is really wrong in God's eyes, in the eyes of the law. 
but she felt the Holy Spirit to prompt her. And you know, sometimes, and I think this season we have come through with all these rules that have been imposed, have been imposed on us with COVID, and we're not sure what to do. Whose rules are we obeying? Should we obey God? Should we not obey God? There's going to come a time, girls, when we are going to have to stand up and say, you know what? Enough is enough. I have to follow what God is saying to me. I'm not going to go and break ridiculous rules, but I have to be led by the Holy Spirit. And in her culture, you know, it was, it was a culture of hospitality. And what does she do? She gives hospitality, but then she goes against all of that. And, you know, Jesus was a rule breaker. I know it sounds controversial, but he was, and I'm going to speak about it. You know, I wonder how Jesus would have gone through COVID. I've got some ideas. But anyways, but anyways, I'm not going to speak them online here. But, <laughs> but I do believe Jesus, Jesus broke rules, not because he was being rebellious, because he was challenging the abusive behaviors that rules brought. You know, it said in the Bible, do not touch lepers because you will be unclean and you'll have to go outside. But Jesus touched lepers, even though the rules of his day said that in doing so, he would become unclean. He went against what everybody said. Can you imagine people, him, him taking him aside and saying, uh, just to let you know, Jesus, what the Bible says, Jesus, you've just touched a leper. You know you're unclean. He went against what they said. He healed on a Sabbath. Can you imagine the Pharisees saying to him, look, these are the rules. You can only walk 10 feet or you can only do this. You can't do that this Sunday. And yet he healed on a Sunday because he went against it because he saw the broken. You know, at the beginning of COVID, I can remember someone saying, well, that goes the end. that's the end of the ministry, takeameal.com, because we can't go to people who have COVID. We can't help people because it's not necessary. And I just said, I thought about it and I prayed and I said, well, this is what I really feel we should do. For those that don't feel able to go, for those that are fearful, for those that are shielding, absolutely. But for those of us that really believe that we are taking a meal in Jesus' name, we are going the extra mile, we are crossing the road, I believe God will honor us. And I can remember the first person I went to, and I, I walked in with my, with my groceries and went in to see her, and she stopped me. She goes, please don't come in. I'm, I'm full of COVID. And I was like, I know it's okay. And, you know, and, and then I thought, waking up, why is up here? Did I even have a mask on? <laughs> I forgot all the rules. I just felt so sorry for this person. And I put them down and I said, I pray. She goes, please stay two feet back when you pray for me. Cause I wanted to lay my hands on her. And I said, okay. I'll st so I stayed, I stayed back six feet and I prayed over her and blessed her. And I walked out and I said, okay, Lord, now can you just help me? I think I've broken a few rules there and I'm really sorry, you know? But my two daughters, they gave birth in COVID. I wasn't going to not go into their homes and help them with their sections and pick up babies. If I was following the rules of the government, I don't know what would have happened, you know? So there's common sense. I didn't go out of my way to have a party in my house and do things, you know? So sometimes God asks us and challenges us. So pray about things. He has an answer. He will never lead you to be rebellious. God does not give us a rebellious spirit, but he does give us wisdom. He does give us discernment. And so jail, in all of these circumstances, she must have toyed with, this is wrong. The law of Moses says this. I'm breaking a commandment here, but I feel God leading me. And in doing that, she actually helped save a nation. There became peace in that land. And you know, Deborah and Barak, in the next few verses, they sang the most incredible story and song about her. I just wanted to give a personal illustration just now. And this is a story of my dad. In 1973, we were in this country and um, there had been a coup in Afghanistan. A coup in Afghanistan is when there's a change of government. There had been, for hundreds of years, there had been a monarchy in the land. There had been a king. And in 1973, um, there, he was ousted by his cousin. The king was out of the country in Italy visiting. And his cousin came and took over. And so Afghanistan went from a monarchy to, a, to, a, um, you know, to having a prime minister or president. And so what they did was they, they, they came, the Russians were behind it, and they wrote a list of all the Christians. It was a couple of traders, 
amongst the newly about amongst the Christians who had found Jesus in that land. And these traders helped write a list of the missionaries that needed to be expelled from that land. And so the missionaries were literally given 24 hours to pack up their goods, get in the car, and to head for the border in Afghanistan. My dad's name was on that list, but we were in this country. And so the missionaries were sent out. My dad was here. My dad was itinerating and raising money to go back to Afghanistan. And he felt prompted by the Holy Spirit that he would be back there. But how was he going to be back? His passport was full of stamps of Afghanistan. And one day he was praying about it. The missionaries that were left in the country sent him a message to say, all the missionaries on the list have been left the country. You are on the list. So don't even try to come back into the land. So the rules of the country said he wasn't allowed back. The missionaries and Christians said, please don't come back. You're a bad omen because you were on that list. Not all the missionaries were on that list. But my dad felt prompted by the Holy Spirit. And so one day he's having a cup of coffee. He's, lo he's praying and reading and he's looking at, his, he's looking at a, a, a bottle of water and he's looking at his passport and thinking, if I drop my passport into a bucket of water and it ruins and it smudges it, I would need a new passport. That's a good idea. That's a Holy Spirit idea. That's what he did. That was in the days before there was computers. So his passport went into a bucket of water. He wrote to the home office, I'm so sorry. My passport, is, I, I, it fell into a bucket of water. I need a new passport. He got a fresh passport. No evidence he's ever been in the country. Now, how is he going to get back? The Christians don't want him. The law of the land doesn't want him. But the Holy Spirit is prompting him to go back. And so he then thinks, I'm going to get a tourist visa. And he got a tourist visa for one month. And he arrives back in the country. My mom and dad and us four little kids arrive with our suitcases. And we arrive back in the country. And, my, and the Christians were horrified that he was there. Some of the Christians were horrified because he, there, someone's going to recognize him. My dad said it was hard at the airport to hear the language and not to con converse. He pretended he didn't know the language. So he, within two or three weeks... He went to the university and he said, I'm, I'm a tourist in the land and I feel that I would love to become a student in your university. So he signed up and they gave him a, on his passport a visa for four years to become a student. And he did a BA in Persian in Afghanistan and he learned the language and he, and, and he did a BA and went back to university. My dad said it was the most, it was the four most profitable years ever. Because you know this Bible that Ian spoke about, my dad in those years, he was able to be a student in the morning and in the afternoon devote himself to help translating this Bible and to work with the missionaries and to work with the Afghan believers. And you know, the missionaries realized he was, he was never found out. He worked there under the radar for those four years. And then when he came back into this country, he was able to go back and forth once, once a year, once every two years, he went back and forth. You see, there comes a time when we have to say, I am not obeying the law of the land. I know my name is on a list, but I'm not going to obey the, obey the land. Remember, remember the midwives, they said in, in Moses' time, kill all the babies. And they said, oh, it's amazing. These, these women deliver their babies before we arrive. Yes, it was a lie, but it said God honored them, God blessed them, and God gave them babies. Sometimes God asks us to stand up and be counted. And so, you know, that's what I would take from this story of jail. And she used what she had. She used what she had she listened to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. She didn't discount, oh, what if, what if. She went by them. She used the gifts and the tools that she had. She remembered the stories of God. She wanted to be part of that and nothing else. And, you know, I believe they went from strength to strength. I, I can't wait till I meet her and find out what happened to her. What stories did she tell her children? What, what, what did her children end up becoming? Because they had a mom who had a strong faith. And I just believe, you know, every story in the Bible is there for a purpose. And so let that story awaken something within us that we're going to come out of this season stronger, seeking God for discernment and wisdom for everything we do. And allow the Holy Spirit to convict us about um, the opportunities we have. And remember, opportunities can come and they can go and they may not come again. Okay? Be blessed. Thank you.